Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and I've been making videos on this channel for over 4 years now. I've covered tons and tons of topics in over 500 videos. One thing that I always made sure to do since the very beginning is read through all the comments. Every day the first thing that I do when I wake up is I go through all the comments and answer any questions that I find. Usually I reply directly to that person, but if at least one person has a question then chances are there's more people wondering the same thing. So in this video let's check out some interesting questions that I saw that maybe you would also like to know the answer to. If you find this format useful, go ahead and hit the like button. I've already answered probably over a thousand questions, so if you find this helpful, I've got many more questions and answers that I can highlight in future videos. But before I get to any specific questions, let me just answer a general comment that I see many times. Usually it's some form of, I didn't understand anything, or alternatively, this doesn't work. My answer to those is always the same, you need to first identify and specify what it is exactly you don't understand. I'm trying to help people, but there's not much I can do if someone just says that. So what specifically didn't you understand? How exactly does it not work? Is there a certain object that is not spawning? Or maybe it's just not visible? Is the code not compiling? Is there some errors in the console? Basically, without knowing exactly what doesn't work or what they didn't understand, without that there's really not much I can do to help. The only way to learn is to first identify what it is you're trying to learn. So if somebody asks me how C Sharp events work, I can point them to my video and elaborate further on that. If someone tells me they have a null reference exception, I can also tell them my method for finding the culprit using debug.log. If an object isn't glowing, I can point them to the glow checklist and so on. But if someone just says it didn't work or I didn't understand anything, then from that comment I really don't have enough information to be able to help. Maybe that person doesn't understand Unity basics, maybe they don't know what is a component or what is a game object, maybe they don't know what is a C sharp delegate or what is a variable, maybe they understood the code but not the why. So anyways, my point with this is, if you've ever watched a video and you thought to yourself you don't understand anything, stop the video and take some time to identify exactly what it is you don't understand. If you do that, I guarantee you will learn much, much quicker. Okay, so with that general comment out of the way, let's look at some specific questions. And a while ago I made a video and posted it for YouTube channel members and Patreon patrons. If you're a member, you can ask a question in that video, check the link in the member page or click the button below to join the YouTube membership. So starting off with a question posted from that video. Here Ken asks about a project taking longer and longer to open as you add more and more assets. Basically, if you import a bunch of mega bundles that have thousands of assets, if you do that then your project becomes huge and pretty difficult to work with. My solution to that is one that I covered in another video. Basically, you should only import the assets that you really need. So what I do is I have a test project where I import tons of assets, so that project is truly massive and takes a long time to open since it has thousands of assets. Then in that project I find the specific asset that I'm looking for, and when I do, I just select that asset, I export just that asset along with any textures or materials that it requires. I do just that, make a simple Unity package with that single asset, and that is the only thing that I import into my main project. So basically my main project ends up only containing the assets that I actually use, instead of a massive library where 99% of it is never used. Just doing that very simple process really helps keep the project lean and fast. So that's the process for keeping the project fast with regards to assets. But over here Ken also mentions a Unity tool that can help with a similar issue, the assembly definitions. These are some simple assets that you can create in your project which lets you separate your code into multiple assemblies. Meaning that when you go to compile your code, Unity only compiles the assemblies that need recompiling instead of recompiling your entire code base every time. So on a massive project, if you organize things correctly and each thing in its own assembly, if you do that then making changes in the code won't compile super fast. I have a lecture on my Ultimate Unity Overview course explaining how to use assembly definitions in detail, definitely super useful on those massive projects. That course covers tons of things like for example this one that are really hard to include in regular videos because of the YouTube algorithm, so if you're interested in learning about those more niche things, check out the course. This next question is a simple one. It's on my video on how I made a function timer class in my utilities. It's a super simple class that takes in a delegate and runs it after a certain amount of time. It's really easy to use and lets me add some timing to the code in a really simple way. And the question comes from Safan who asks simply why not using coroutine. Coroutines are indeed useful for triggering actions after some time. You have yield return wait for seconds to wait for a certain amount of time, so that's one way to do it. However, the reason why I personally dislike coroutines is because of the pattern that they force you to use. For a coroutine to work, you need to change the function return type to iEnumerator. You also need to use yield return, then you need to call start coroutine somewhere to start it, and you also need a mono behavior to run it. For me, I find that entire pattern to be quite clumsy and a very rigid set of requirements, so for me, I much rather create just a, an extremely simple class with a basic flow timer and a delegate that I can use in any way. But on the other hand, if you don't like using coroutines, then don't let me discourage you. 
If the goal is to trigger an action after some time, then either method works. This next question is related to animations. It's from the video on how to aim and shoot at the mouse in 2D. In the video, I teach how to create a game object, rotate it to face the mouse position, and trigger an animation to shoot. Then for the question, this person asks how am I able to shoot and restart the animation before the animation ends. And actually, this question isn't really correct. In the video, in this demo, I am not able to restart the animation before it ends. The reason why it looks like that is simply because I made the shoot animation super fast, like literally just one or two frames. However, what you can learn from this question is that the animator has a special state called any state, which is indeed intended exactly for this use case. If you make a transition from any state to something else, then that transition will be tested regardless of which is the current active state. So in this particular case, if you had a shoot animation that is pretty long and you wanted to make sure that the player could cancel the previous shoot animation with another shoot action, to do that, you could simply make a transition from any state onto the shoot state. That way, even if you shoot while the shoot animation is still playing, it would indeed shoot again. So always remember to use the any state in the animator. It's super useful and absolutely essential for making your animations nice and responsive to player input. This next question is an interesting one, all about simple games to remake. It's from the video 7 steps to become a game developer. It's a pretty nice video where I cover 7 concrete steps you can take to start making games. If you're the kind of person who feels overwhelmed by all of the options, then a simple step-by-step -step guide like this one can be helpful. And in the video, step 1 is start by making a ton of extremely tiny simple games. The goal is basically to learn through quantity. Making tons of tiny games will teach you a lot more than making a single large game when you're just starting out. So this question comes from Srinivasa Paduri. Sorry if I messed up your name. And the question is pretty much, can you share some games to replicate in the step 1? And my answer to that is pretty much any of the classic games will do. For example, Snake is pretty simple. You just move a snake with simple movement. You'll learn about collisions and you eat some fruit. Then Arkanoid is also pretty simple. It helps you learn about physics and angles. Pong is similar to that one, but also helps you create some basic AI. Or of course, just recreate a bunch of simple mobile games, things on the scale of Flappy Bird. Even for a beginner, you can definitely build that in one week and learn quite a bit. If you want something a step above that, then perhaps look into Pac-Man, maybe into Pinball, maybe Missile Command. Basically, if you're on that stage, try making as many super tiny games as you can. This is pretty much how I unintentionally started my game dev journey. As you might know, I started by making Flash games back in 2008. I covered my game dev journey in another video, it's a really nice one, so if you haven't seen that one, go ahead and give it a watch. In the 5 years that I was making Flash games, I ended up making about 40 unique games. I made everything from shooters to strategy, racing, tycoon games, and everything in between. I really believe that doing that process is what helped me massively grow my game dev skills. I certainly believe that I learned a lot more making those 40 unique games than if I had attempted to make just one single giant game. So if you're in the beginner stage, I really recommend you try doing that. Try making tons and tons of extremely simple games. And when you're done with that, that is essentially step one, so check out the other steps in that video. This next question is all about various rotation methods and comes from my recently released turn-based strategy course. In there, one of the lectures is all about handling the unit rotation, making it rotate towards the move direction so the unit rotates and moves forward. To do that, I explain that there are basically three methods. You can modify the transform.rotation. This one involves working with quaternions, which I always find pretty confusing, so I tend to avoid this method. The next one is you can modify the transform.euler angles. This lets you work with regular angles that you're probably familiar with, you know the ones that go from 0 to 360. And finally, you can rotate the object by modifying the transform dot forward directly. This is the method that I find simplest, so it's the one that I use in the course. And this question comes from Clayton Rumley, who asks, what about transform dot look at? Is this one a good alternative, or is there any reason why you shouldn't use it? And the answer is, yep, that is indeed a great alternative. Transform dot look at does exactly the same thing as modifying the transform dot forward. The only difference is that when modifying the transform dot forward, for that one, you use a direction. Whereas for transform.lookat, for that one, you use the target position. But either way, both methods work perfectly. So whenever you need to rotate a certain object, these are the multiple ways you can do that. If you want to learn how to make a complex game step by step, then check out that turn-based strategy course link in the description. It will help you transition from the beginner stage into advanced. Alright, so those are a bunch of your questions and my answers to those. Like I said, this is a new format that I'm trying out. If you like this format, go ahead and hit the like button and let me know in the comments. Since I've been answering questions like this for the past 4 years, I have hundreds or even thousands of interesting questions, so there's tons that I could include in videos like this one, which may answer some questions that some of you might also have. So like I said, do let me know in the comments if you find this helpful and if you'd like to see some more like this. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.